for instance this is called if you just want to embody plethysmography so it is basically to see your um, functional residual capacities as well as residual volume various static volumes similarly there is a cardiopulmonary exercise testing this helps you in differentiating whether your breathlessness is related to your heart or whether it is because of the lung problem. Similarly, helium dilution and other things. So what we are going to do is to restrict our uh, talk only on these two basic edges. One is called peak flow meter and one is this is called a spirometer. So let's the object, what uh, is a spirometry? A spirometry is a time measurement of the dynamic lung volume during force expiration and inspiration to quantify how effectively and how quickly the lungs can empty and fill. So basically, it is just that how much air can go inside your lungs and how much you can expire from out of the lung. That volume is being measured in relation to the time, how effectively how quickly you can empty your lungs. This is what basically the spirometry uh, helps in determining. So objective will be to define the lung volume and the capacity. We will discuss that as measured by the spirometry. We can distinguish between the resting vital capacity, that is when you are breathing slowly from maximum aspiration to the to the end of the um, uh, end of the expiration. Similarly, force vital capacity. There are two types of vital capacity. One when you do normally, and when you really force your lungs, uh, force the air out of your lung, that is called force vital capacity. Similarly, uh, there is one other thing called force expiratory volume in one second. That is the amount of air which you expire in one second. This is basically the assessment of your major figure airways functioning. And then from these two values, that is FVC and FVV1, we can, uh, we can determine the ratio between these two uh, and can help you in differentiating into major diseases, major group of lung diseases, that is the obstructive airway disease and the restrictive airway disease. We will talk about that. So basically, it helps in dif uh, distinguishing between restrictive. There is a big group of restrictive lung diseases and there is a group of obstructive lung diseases. It can also define that is the force expiratory flow. That is the flow, uh, how much between uh, 25 to 70 percent of your expired air and also helps you in drawing flow volume loop, which you will see all when we will talk about that. And that can also help you in differentiating between obstructive and lung volume. But above all, it can help you in determining the site of major airway obstruction. That is the dynamic airway compression, where exactly it is. So why do we do pulmonary function tests? Basically, whenever a person comes to you with the breathlessness and you cannot find what is the cause of the breathlessness so you do like to do the lung function testing in this similarly if there is a wheezing cough or a strider that is the major airways being obstructed causing inspiratory sound which is we call strider so that is uh, also uh, can be determined the site from where it is the obstruction uh, it helps you in differentiating as i mentioned to you to a certain extent that whether the breathlessness is uh, related to your lung disorder or whether it's related to your cardiac disorder. For broad purposes, I mean, if your lung functions are normal, so you should look for the cardiac causes. As I said to you, there is another uh, testing that is called cardiopulmonary exercising, which basically helps you clearly differentiating between these two. But at least it gives you a little bit of an idea where the breathlessness is coming from. Then uh, screening for the respiratory disease in certain high risk situation. For instance, if you are being pre-employing somebody in a condition where there is a likelihood that he may develop uh, occupational asthma. Let's say if a person is working in a cement factory. Now, in our country, I mean, it is okay, but abroad, if suppose during the work, if he develops breathlessness and he's found to be having an occupational uh, asthma, he can sue the factory employer that because of your working in your uh, company, I have got this problem of occupational asthma. Before that, I was perfectly normal. So he can claim a file for compensation. So these sort of things uh, is basically also being done for assessment prior to 
entering into any high risk occupation where you are likely to develop occupational there are 200 uh, um, chemicals where you can get from which you can get occupational asthma for instance people working in bakery people involved in the spray painting all these things similarly if a person has been involved in high risk occupations like uh, say with scuba he's training himself or training other people for scuba then he has to be checked for his lung function uh, as i mentioned to you the biggest advantage is that it can help you in differentiating between obstructive and a restrictive lung disease it can tell you uh, where is the upper airway obstructed it can also help you in determining the weakness of the lung uh, muscle because your pulmonary respiratory muscles that also helps you in breathing so if a person cannot uh, increase his respiratory breathing uh, power that is because of his muscle weakness and uh, serial assessment can also help you in measuring whether it is improving or getting worse and similarly response to the other treatment. Like for instance, there is a lung condition, there is a muscle weakness called galliand barre syndrome. I don't know whether you know about it. That is a very progressive uh, weakness. So to assess whether it is really uh, affecting the respiratory muscles or not, you keep on serial checking of his lung functions every day. And if it is sudden deterioration in the lung function, <coughs> excuse me, you refer this patient to ICU because he may go on to ventilator at any time. Assessment of impairment of uh, respiratory diseases in workplace and setting, uh, as I mentioned to you, and also there is a thing called pulmonary rehabilitation, where you check serial uh, lung function to see whether with your therapy of rehabilitation, patient is getting better or not. Compensation for occupational disease, I've already mentioned you should be. Similarly, preoperative assessment, particularly if suppose if a smoker comes to you, and uh, he is okay, but you, he's going for a major abdominal or a chest surgery. You want to assess his lung function because people who have got obstructive lung disease, COPD, they will do badly after the surgery. So one has to be already knowing what is the condition of this lung function before that. There are certain uh, contraindications uh, which you should be keeping in mind where you cannot request for that uncooperative patient if patient has got an active tb this is another condition now in our cases now the coronavirus is there so if somebody has got coronavirus you can't do because your machine is going to be get infected with that so similarly if somebody is having an active hemoptysis he is currently having a pneumothorax um, uh, particularly for the first three months you have to be very careful <coughs> because no force expiratory maneuver should be done by them Unstable angina, recent MI, aneurysm, and history of syncopies because when you forcefully expire, you can lose your consciousness. Similarly, unconscious patient. Usual preparation is that if a person has been smoking, he should avoid it for 24 hours. No vigorous exercise, 30 minutes prior to do. Tight uh, clothing should be avoided. Heavy meal should be avoided before doing the test. And you should also ask for inhaler, whether he has used inhaler or any bronchodilator medicine recently or not. Because you may be doing a reversibility testing, which we will talk about later. Uh, so in that case, the person should not have taken any short-acting bronchodilator, which use the inhaler in the last four to six hours and long, a long-acting bronchodilator for the last 24 hours. Similarly, oral bronchodilator should not be. Because uh, there is a test which we do is called reversibility test. That is, you check the person lung function and then give them bronchodilators and see whether there is an improvement or not. In the asthma lecture, I have showed, I have discussed that bronchodilator reversibility test. So if a person has already taken uh, bronchodilators, so he may not, he or she may not show any reversibility. So that's why it has to be avoided prior to that. The factor which is affecting normally we calculate. The, um, now there is an automatic machines, they calculate, you just have to put the height, age, and gender, and ethnicity to a certain extent, okay, which background he is from. So that uh, helps you in determining what should be the predictive uh, lung volume of this person. And then you compare it from there. I mean, 10% above or 10% below, or the predicted value is well accepted, but anything which is significantly lower than the predictive, then there is a certain problem. So predicted value depends upon the height, age, gender, and ethnicity. 
Now, this is a simple gadget which we use is called peak flow meter. Peak flow meter is that it's a simple way or it is a surrogate of FEV1. That is, you take a deep breath in, fill up your lungs, put this mouthpiece, this mouthpiece in your mouth, seal your lips around it and just give one big blow. There is a pointer here, uh, needle here. This will go further and you measure it like let's say 400 and 500 whatever it is then from this chart which is given here you know that depending upon his height age and gender what is the normal predictive value of peak expiratory flow and you can compare it that it is a very useful tool i mean particularly in the management of asthma it can help you in diagnosis of asthma which i have told you in the, in the asthma lecture it can also assess the severity of asthma. It can also uh, help you in determining the response to your therapy. And um, similarly, uh, whether the patient is uh, improving with the therapy or is not improving the therapy. So this is a very important gadget for the management of asthma. It's very underutilized in our country. If you go to the medical wards, you may see a lot of asthma patients, but none of them will be uh, checking their peak flow. Now, without this, you cannot assess the severity of asthma. You cannot see whether the patient is responding to your treatment or not because severity is under assessed by the doctor as well as the patient. And that is one of the causes of the sudden death in these patients. So one should use an objective measurement of severity of asthma. Now, as you know that you cannot treat hypertension without having a manometer. Similarly, you cannot treat a diabetic patient without having a glucometer. The same thing is stand true for that you cannot treat asthma without having a peak flow meter recording on that. So it is a very essential component for the management of asthma. Uh, in abroad, I mean, a lot of patients themselves has got this simple gadget like diabetic patients can have a glucometer and can alter their management according to the blood sugar levels. Similarly, they can alter their asthma and treatment depending upon the peak flow. So this is a very important uh, tool uh, in the management of asthma, peak expiratory flow measurement. It is basically the maximum amount of air which a person expires in first 10 milliseconds. Very quickly, you have to just give us a blow and you measure it. So first 10 milliseconds. Now, uh, these are all the objective which I have already mentioned to you, so you don't know advantages and disadvantages. It is very uh, uh, effort dependent thing, so you have to be particularly sure that a person is making a good effort. It costs less than thousand rupees, so every patient can have that to see the severity of that. Now, coming to the spirometry, before we start the spirometry, you should be knowing that there are certain a lung volume, there are four lung volume and there are four capacities, right? So four capacities, capacities is the summation of two volumes. When you combine two volumes, this is called capacity. For instance, this is a residual volume and this is an expiratory reserve volume. So if you combine these two, it becomes a functional residual capacity. Similarly, uh, this is an inspiratory reserve volume and this is a tidal volume. If you combine these, it becomes inspiratory capacity. If you combine all them, it is total lung capacity. There are four capacities and four lung volumes. So we can discuss that. What are these? So what is a tidal volume? I wish there should have been a graph. Tidal volume is the normal amount of air which you inspire and expire during a normal resting breathing. So that is called tidal volume. Uh, if I go back, this is the normal tidal volume. So it is around 500 ml. This is the normal quiet breathing. Now, if you, if you take a deep breath in after make a normal inspiration and go to the maximum, this is called inspiratory reserve volume, which is anything above from the, the from the inspiratory uh, uh, from the normal tidal inspiration the maximum amount of air which you can inhale after that and you take a normal inhaler inhalation and then you breathe in like this so this is inspiratory reserve volume and from there 
I mean, if for, for instance, from the tidal volume, I am normally breathing and then I try to expire out completely. This is called expiratory reserve volume. No, I can't do any further than that. So this is an expiratory reserve volume. This is the volume which I can use up during the exercise. So expiratory reserve volume and whatever is left in the lung, you cannot totally empty your lung because the lung will collapse like a balloon. You cannot inflate a totally, I mean, a closed balloon. But if there is some air inside already, then it is easier to blow it out. So similarly, there is a little amount of air which is always left. That is around 20%, which is left in your lung. This is called residual volume. This cannot be measured by the, by the normal spirometry. So this is the limitation that this volume cannot be measured. So we cannot measure what is the total lung capacity and similarly we can uh, res uh, functional residual capacity cannot be measured by the spirometry because it is a combination of the two. The rest can be measured by that. The tidal volume and these are the things. So let's uh, describe that. So the volume of gas inspired or expired during each normal or unforced respiratory cycle, the normal breathing which you are doing, expiratory reserve, the maximum volume of the gas that you can expire after normal expiration. From the end expiration, you breathe out, like normally you are normally taking breathe in and breathe out. And from there onward, if you can breathe out completely, this is called expiratory reserve volume, like I force myself out. So that is the expiratory reserve volume. Similarly, the maximum volume of gas that you can inspire after normal inspiration, you have taken a normal inspiration and then you force maximum amount of air inside your lung. This is called inspiratory reserve volume and residual volume I've mentioned to you the amount of air which is left in the lung, uh, which is around 20% uh, uh, that is about 1.2 liters. That is always going to remain in your lung. You cannot breathe that out completely. In patients who have got obstructive airway disease, this residual volume increases because there is an obstruction to the airway. So now combining the two things, we can have the capacities. So total lung capacity is the volume of gas in the lung at the end of maximum aspiration. So combining all the volumes, that is the thing. After taking a maximum inspiration, you breathe out in completely like this. Now, the amount of air which is now in my lung is called total lung capacity. Similarly, the vital capacity is the maximum volume of gas that can be forcefully expelled from the minimal inspiration. So this is called vital capacity, inspiratory capacity, and the functional, uh, functional residual capacity. Functional residual capacity is important because this is depending on your exercise. Now, there is a change in supine and in the standing position. If you do spirometry, usually it is always done in a sitting position. Uh, but if it is done, somebody is, uh, then there will be, remember that there will be certain changes. Particularly, change is in the expiratory reserve volume. That is the amount of air which you can expire. Right? That is the one. This is the green one. So, expiratory reserve volume will be lower in the spine position. Why? Because your diaphragm is right up. There. So you cannot uh, uh, expire much from there. So this is the main difference between the two. Now this was the old spirometry which we used to do at JPMC chest squat long, long ago, about 25 years ago, where person used to blow in the spine and the machine used to move and we used to record the amount of air which is coming out of his lung in, in relation to the time. Now, these, we have got modern gadgets now available, so you can do it. I mean, there should be a clip on the nose so that you don't expire through your nose. All expiratory air should go into the machine. So these are different types of spirometers which have been used. And what is basically it is going to measure is that from a total lung capacity, that is you after maximum inspiration, you inspire completely, and then you start ex uh, exhaling forcefully. So whatever you expel in first second will be the FB, uh, FEV1, ex force expiratory volume in one second. So this will be the measurement of that. For instance, uh, about 80% of your uh, vital care, 80% uh, of your total uh, lung volume can be expelled in first second. So 
So this is FEV1. And uh, then you continue breathing out, continue breathing out a very little amount of air you can breathe out further after maximum uh, expiration. And this is after six minutes, it is called FVC, force volume, force, uh, volume, uh, uh, force vital capacity. So it is called force vital capacity. That is in six seconds, whatever amount of air you can expel out, that is called or the maximum amount of air you can expel. And one which you expel in the first second, which is the major component, 80%, that is uh, the FEV1. So then from there, you can uh, uh, calculate the ratio. Uh, calculate the ratio. Uh, what is the ratio between FEV1 and FVC? Now, remember that in obstructive lung disease, this ratio is going to drop by less than 70%. Why? Because the maximum involvement FEV1, that is the force expiratory volume in one second is maximally affected. That is basically measurement of your larger airways resistance. So if there is a narrowing of the larger airways, you will be able, not be able to expire much of your air. The vital capacity is less affected, so the ratio drops. So this is more effective, this is less effective, so the ratio drops. Okay, and again, the, to assess the severity of obstructive airway disease, you can do FVV1. The, the, this is because it decreases more than FVC, and you can also uh, check that uh, how severe is your obstructive airway disease by checking the FVV1. If it is less than 70, it is as uh, uh, mild obstruction and it is less than 50 severe obstructive lung disease, uh, moderate lung disease and less than 30 percent it is a severe so fev1 like peak expiratory flow as i mentioned to you peak expiratory flow the machine the gadget which i shown you is basically a surrogate uh, of fev1 now Restrictive lung disease, the ratio will be greater than 70% because FVV, FVC will reduce, but less mark than FVC. So the ratio remains high. All right. Uh, here in the restrictive, this component is more decreased. So the ratio is either normal or even increased. So this is what happens in restrictive lung disease. So depending upon the ratio between the two, we can differentiate whether it's an obstructive or lung disease. So this is how we calculate the ratio. That is FEV1 on the top, FVC down, multiply by 50, and it comes out to be 55% of the predicted value. So this is in obstructive lung disease. Um, uh, here, you can see that FVV1 is not severely affected as compared to uh, this FVC, the multiplier ratio, it comes out to be above 70%. So this is a restrictive lung disease. This is the differentiation between obstructive and restrictive lung disease. Basically, what we are measuring is the ratio, which is giving us an idea. Here, restrictive, it will be normal or high normal, and it will be reduced. In mild, it will be little reduced. In severe, it will be more reduced. So this is the main difference. Then if you are able to measure residual volume by doing by using other machines, then you will find other differences like uh, total lung volume will be reduced in obstructive lung disease. Uh, to, uh, in restrictive, it will be reduced. In obstructive, it will be more. And similarly, residual volume is reduced in restrictive lung disease and obstructive. And, but, but these two parameters we cannot use with spirometry. So you don't need to bother about it. You just may uh, remember the ratio that is the important. As I said to you, the FEV1 can also tell you the severity of the restriction or the severity of the obstruction. So if FEV1 is taken as, uh, if it is uh, greater than 80%, uh, it is mild. If it is 50 to 70%, it is uh, moderate. If it is less than 30%, between 30 to 50, it's uh, severe. And if it is less than 30, it is very severe. Now, in restrictive lung disease, the FVV1 has to be taken into consideration because this is going to be more markedly affected in restrictive lung disease. <sighs> the same thing which has been shown here. Now, the other thing which you can do, you can do with a simple peak flow meter also, but with the, uh, with the spirometer also, that you measure the FVV1, give them bronchodilators and measure after 10 minutes. And if you find that improvement of 200 ml, or 12% from the, from the initial one, 
you can uh, you can 12 percent from the initial one you can say that this is a reversible bronchodilator reversibility test is positive so bronchodilation reversibility of more than 200 ml or more than 12 percent in fvv1 is considered to be the diagnostic for asthma this is the same thing which has been shown here. Light C, this is the normal F, this should be the normal FEV1 of the person. He came to you, it was lower than normal. You give them a bronchodilator and you find that there is a 12% improvement after that. Sorry, this is the normal person. This, uh, I'm sorry. This is a normal person FEV1 here. And this is before the bronchodilator is given. If it improved by 12%, or 200 ml absolute, you can confirm that this is an asthmatic patient. Similarly, this is a flow volume loop I'm going to just tell you. So again, the same thing that you can divide the lungs into two major groups, obstructive, where the ratio between FEV1 and FVC is reduced. Usually the things are COPD, asthma. These are the main from drug or diseases which cause obstructive lung disease. Restrictive, the ratio is going to be normal or higher than normal. There are extra pulmonary causes for restrictive lung disease like obesity, chest wall deformity, pleural effusion. There are a lot of things. And then there are the lung causes like uh, ARDS, pneumoconiosis, interstitial uh, pulmonary fibrosis. So all these causes are restrictive. So in this way, we can uh, at least divide uh, the lung diseases into two major groups. Now, finally, I'm coming to the lung volume. What do you do in lung uh, flow volume loop? Here, basically, flow in relation to volume is being measured. Now, like a spirometry, you start with maximum inhalation. Your lungs are full. You start breathing out completely. Here you do complete. You go up, uh, go on expiring, expiring, expiring. Here you see the peak, ex uh, peak expiratory flow. That is the maximum amount of air which you have been able to expire in one second. And then after that, you will not be able to expire completely and gradually your uh, force expiratory flow will keep on reducing and reducing till it comes to the residual volume. So this is going to be your residual volume. You cannot expire or the flow will stop here because you will not be able to make any further flow. From there onwards, you take a maximum inspiration. This is not we, we, we do normal spirometry, but when we want to make a flow volume loop, then we ask the person that after he has expired completely, he has to take a deep breath in and fill up his lung to the total lung capacity. That is here. It will come back again here. Right? So the shape of this loop can also tell us whether it's an obstructive lung disease or a restrictive lung disease. This is the normal. In obstructive lung disease, as I said to you, this is the FEV1 which is going to be severely affected, so it will come down. And the inspiratory volume will remain the same. But in restrictive lung disease, both are affected equally. So you can see the, 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 the FEV1 is not that significantly affected like here. So the ratio, if you measure here, and if you measure here, will be normal. Here, it will be more reduced as compared to this one. So you measure the distance from the maximum. So if you find that there is a discrepancy, FEV1 is more reduced as compared to FEC, it is obstructive. If they are equally affected, then it is restrictive lung disease. So this is one advantage, obstructive lung disease. This is how it looks like. The other advantage is that you can see the obstruction in the major airways through the flow volume loop. So the flow volume loop helps in you where is the obstruction? And the, this phenomenon is, depends upon that during expiration, the, the intrathoracic and the extrathoracic component of the trachea behave differently. Now, during expiration, the extra uh, thoracic, which is above the hair, which is above, during expiration, because there is a negative pressure in the airways, it's going to expand. All right, it will going to be expanding. You can see that here during inspiration, the upper portions, just listen to the up, see the upper portion and then we will discuss the lower portion. So during expiration, it opened up because of the negative pressure. All right. And during inspiration, it will collapse because there is an atmospheric pressure. During a negative pressure, it will go down. So here there is a force expiration. The 
pressure inside the trachea is more, it will open up. And in inspiration, the pressure inside the trachea is less because the air has to go inside. So the, the atmospheric pressure will compress the um, trachea. So this little compression can help us whether there is a upper, way, upper airway obstruction uh, above the uh, above the suprasternal notch or below the suprasternal notch. Now, if there is a thick obstruction, there will be no changes in, during the inspiration or expiration. So the flow volume loop will be flattened both on the top as well as at the bottom. So you will not see anything. I mean, this will be this is the shape of the fixed upper airway obstruction. Now. What are the causes of fixed upper way obstruction? Tracheal stenosis, goiter, uh, endotracheal uh, neoplasm, and bronchial stenosis. So this causes fixed airway obstruction. Now the other thing which you have to remember is when there is an intrathoracic obstruction, there will be a difference in the behavior. For instance, if it is a variable type of airway obstruction, that is, it can change <coughs> with the respiration. Uh, so what will happen is that during the expiration, uh, here it is because the, uh, the intrathoracic pressure rises and compresses the trachea. All right, there is already an obstruction which changes as the volume reduces. So the, the, what you will see that the expiratory loop of the flow volume loop will be flattened out. For the inspiratory loop, when there is a negative pressure, the air is going to go normally inside even if there is an obstruction in the airway, it will allow it to go inside. So the inspiratory volume will be, inspiratory loop will be normal. So if there is a flattening of the expiratory loop, you can, you can say that there is an intrathoracic obstruction. And causes of intrathoracic obstruction is tracheomalacia, uh, polychondritis, tumor of the lower end. Uh, now extrathoracic obstruction, which is above the suprasternal notch, here is the obstruction. It will behave differently because the phenomena which I have just said to you that during inspiration, what will happen that there is a negative pressure, there is an atmospheric pressure, it will, it will cause compression of the trachea above the suprasternal notch. So this will become more narrow and during inspiration, the inspiratory loop will flatten out. You can see that inspiratory loop. But when the person expires, right, this will open up and the expiratory volume will be that. So this is going to be when you see when you see expiratory loop uh, compress uh, or shortened expiratory loop, then you are intrathoracic obstruction. When there is an inspiratory uh, loop is being flattened out, it is a intra uh, it is an extrathoracic obstruction. Now causes of variable extrathoracic obstruction: vocal cord paralysis, vocal cord dysfunction, uh, vocal cord uh, restrictions. Uh, pharyngeal, uh, reduced pharyngeal cross-section area. So these are all the air, uh, airway burns. So all these conditions can cause variable extrathoracic obstruction where you will find the flattening of the inspiratory loop. So by change, seeing the shape of that, you can determine where is the obstruction and whether it is a variable obstruction or whether it is a fixed obstruction. In the fixed obstruction, you will find that the loop will be fixed both during the inspiration as well as during the expression like this one okay so it will be flat so with that i'm going to stop here thank you very much for listening and i think this is the end of uh, 